Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is wonderful to be here. Um, so I don't have slides. I'm just going to speak. Uh, I'm going oh, right. to Sorry, yeah. try to keep it to about 10 minutes. I'm going to not stare at myself. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's a few things that I wanted to lay out. I, I wrote a paper that was circulated, which I hope was, was useful to some people. Um, it's the case that I, you know, I met Mike Hogan. The reason I'm here is because Mike and I met when I was studying in the Department of Mind, Brain, and Education. And he was hanging out with Howard Gardner and Kurt Fisher and Bob Keegan. And that's when he went to visit uh, uh, John, um, uh, John Warfield. And so I began to think about collective intelligence. And it was at that time that I also began to think about this field of uh, X risk or the study of existential risk, which is the study of risks to all of life and specifically human life. Um, and so this is, of course, a field that begins with the atomic bomb, uh, but then the increasing number of catastrophic and existential risks increases uh, due to the advance of technology, specifically. Uh, and so I kind of ended up, for many reasons, getting into a field where, as a psychologist and an educator, I was working with people who were studying the most consequential problems. Now, interestingly, the people who started the field of X risk kind of, were people doing work in artificial intelligence and risks around artificial intelligence, people like Nick Bostrom, who wrote that New York Times bestseller, uh, Super Intelligence. Uh, and <clears throat> so there's a bunch of risks that come from artificial intelligence, uh, major risks. There are many benefits, of course, that people tout, and you can't deny how cool ChatGPT is, uh, but the risks are interestingly, I think, outweighing the benefits on many fronts, which should have us trying to use collective intelligence in order to bind the power of advanced technology with human wisdom and value. Right now we're in a situation where the infrastructure is primarily technological and economic, are running without being checked by the superstructure, which would be like a government, which would be backed by some type of you know, excuse me, social structure, which would be like a government, which would be backed by some type of view of human dignity that would constrain the colonization of the life world by advanced technology. So Henry Kissinger, arguably one of the most important diplomats of the last century, has been writing books with Schmidt, right? The, car, the uh, former CEO of Apple, very interesting books about AI. One of his main concerns is that we have no way to define human dignity that could constrain the interference of advanced technology in socialization process. So there's a bunch of risks that come from AI that we kind of like know about and have heard about, like Terminator type risks. And this is why the field has been dismissed because it seems like science fiction. But one thing to think about very specifically for educators and educators who evoke indigenous culture at the beginning of meetings is the ecological footprint of AI technology, specifically chat GPT, specifically the size of the GPU clusters and the complexity, intricacy, and materials economy involved in microchip production. So it's very interesting to think about the desire to integrate very radically the use of these technologies in education, uh, sometimes to solve ecological problems when the technology itself is creating a whole host of ecological problems, very fundamentally, even just simply in terms of electricity usage. So we kind of have to factor that when we get optimistic or idealistic about the use of AI in education and be a little bit more conscious. The other thing I would mention also is like the first wave of AI. We weren't talking about AI that much, at least not people who weren't academics weren't talking about AI, or at least academics who weren't studying AI weren't talking about AI. And then the public wasn't talking about AI before it started talking to us. But AI had been curating our news feeds, organizing our flows of information on social media for a very long time. This was the so-called first wave of AI, which was the social technologies. That was terrible. I believe Australia was just like, let's not have kids use that stuff, right? Didn't Australia just basically ban the use of social technologies? 
for kids under 16. So the same class of people with the same interests, with the same venture capital backing, with the same ties to the intelligence agencies in the United States built these technologies that we're now giving out to kids and gleefully predicting will be the next wave of artificial intelligence and education. Why are we as enthusiastic about the next wave as of AI as we were about the, we didn't learn this lesson that actually these technologies are debilitating and they are heavily used and they're made to be profit centers and they're made to be addictive. Uh, we've got newspaper articles coming out about adolescents killing themselves because they are developing relationships with anthropomorphic uh, chatbots that are designed to be anthropomorphic and create relationships with them. So it's a predatory market uh, that has captured public sentiment to embrace it even after the first predatory market, which was the social media, already did a lot of damage. So that's another, I mean, you need to like think about that. So this is also just the, the political economy of the technologies. Educators don't make technologies, right? We're given technologies by a class of technologists who don't have our interests in mind. So that's my other thing there. So there's many risks, of course, I'm not gonna talk about automated weaponry and all this scary stuff, but the one that addresses me as a psychologist, as an educator is what I address in the paper, which is the design parameters towards anthropomorphization, which means chatbots. So I was very happy to see the Eliza thing because that's where it started. Weizenbaum was very much like, don't do this guys. His argument was basically like, you can totally do this. You could totally, you could totally make these things imitate humans. Absolutely, don't do it. Moral restraint on technological possibility. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the technology we're trying to constrain, <clears throat> excuse me, the technology we're trying to constrain is precisely one that can undercut our ability to have the moral intuitions necessary to constrain it. Because it's confusing us about what it means to be a person intentionally. So that's the thing. It's, a, it's they're designing towards anthropomorphization. Think about the Turing test. There were many ways that we could think about what would make for something like artificial intelligence. The canonical thing we look to is, can it imitate a human? What's interesting is some of the most powerful forms of AI, they're not worried about if it's imitating a human. Like if it's optimizing a supply chain, who cares if it thinks like a human or talks like a human, it's optimizing a supply chain, right? If it's optimizing a kill chain in the deployment of AI models within battlefield contexts, they're not particularly concerned if it's imitating a human, but the academics were very interested in that. And of course the marketing guys, <laughs> the marketing guys love it because it's the stickiest technology ever. Uh, so we have to think about the undercutting of the conditions for the possibility of collective intelligence as what AI gives us, not more of the ability to do co collective intelligence unless we fix something very significant about what is occurring for the majority of people who are being socialized with the technology. I'm not talking about adults who have PhDs who have learned to adopt it late in life. I'm talking about adolescents or young people growing up having never not known a world in which there is a technology that will talk to them like a person. Um, the effect of exponentials in technology, like in any field, are hard for our human mind to perceive. Um, and so the risk from AI here isn't the death of all the humans. It's the speciation event that ends a particular type of humanity. And it sounds crazy, and I'll end in a couple minutes. But of course, if you're a transhumanist, this is your design. The idea would be that biological life booted a being created a being, biological life created a being that would then create silicon beings that would then replace biological life. Um, so that's, again, I'm saying this because this is what the people who are building the AI technologies that you're giving to kids are saying, who own a you know, nuclear energy stock in order to build nuclear energy plants to put next to their trillion dollar clusters who have cryogenics where they cut their heads off to, to wake them up later when the AIs can can finally bring them back to life so they don't have to die. So the, the class of elite technologists who are distributing technologies 
and their ideologies have to be examined. So when I'm saying that, <clears throat> there could be creating technologies that would actually end this thing that we know as sapiens. That would end the kind of language use that allows us to take responsibility for ourselves in social networks and social systems. I'm saying that's not like an accident, although it is in a sense a second order effect of what they're saying they're creating. But they're no, long term goals. This is a chair speaking, the actual yes. animated chair saying, My All time right. says you've Over. got to bring it to a close. Okay. All right. So then I was just rambling, basically. So I will bring it to a close. Um, and uh, hope that that was in some way a useful cautionary note. And uh, also, not, a, you know, not any. Part of me believes that there's a future without advanced technologies. That's not the argument. The argument is about finding ways to get actual organic human collective intelligence to bind it, to bind technology. Well, what a well, lovely way to bring it to a close. I mean, <laughs> and rapid too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Zach. What a what a extraordinary um, um, setting. Uh, and such an important voice and I think one that, that often comes at the end so it's lovely to have the cautionary note so early on in the program because it's such an important piece um panel any anything from um responses um to the to the um I guess, Concern seems a little bit mild compared to what you played out, Zach. A stronger word, perhaps. Um, any questions, thoughts? I'm going to, oh, Anna, you please. Thank you, Zach. Um, I'm terrified right now. <laughs> I have to say that I am a quite an impressionable person, you know, for Simon and the people that knows me. <laughs> like I can't watch any, you know, any. So I, you got me like that on my chair, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, if that was your, I think that was your intent. So you succeeded. I, <laughs> well done. I am truly terrified. But, um, and I think there is so much, growth in what you said. I just have this crazy idea. I'm thinking about collective intelligence now, again, because this is what I investigate. And um, I think that really that collective intelligence doesn't necessarily have the same risk as artificial intelligence, because I do believe that some of the key uh, prerequisites of collective intelligence cannot be enabled in artificial being and in artificial intelligence. So I do not believe that collective intelligence will never emerge in a fully digital uh, um, agents group like I don't know how to explain because from how I am studying it, um, collective intelligence is a lot about uh, dynamically giving up something about yourself and changing the rules to adapt to others and many times giving up, uh, saying no to what to your belief, changing your mind, a sort of very adaptive and very uncontrollable uh, behavior, um, which there, but which is not crazy though. So it, it's not random. So I I don't know how to say because I I this stud, this field is so not so much studied, and that's why I think this group is amazing. Um, that I don't that, know. Anna, I'm, I'm going to jump in and then, give Zach right, a chance but... to respond. Yeah, I would, I, I would agree. I would say a couple of things. I would say, you know, if you're looking at intelligence, you look at the dynamics that grow intelligence. I'm a Piagetian, right? So very big distinction for Jean Piaget was this distinction between causality and entailment. So he was looking at self-organizing systems. He was looking at self-organizing systems from the physiosphere through the biosphere, through the 
whatever you'd want to call the animals, biosemiotics, and then up and through the human, and then into logic and mathematics and philosophy of science, all of that being self-organizing systems. Now, at a certain point, they become very different from one another. What's the difference between a self-organizing cultural human system and a self-organizing physical system, or a self-organizing thing like an ecosystem, or a self-organizing thing like a silicon chip, or a huge, enormous set of nested together silicon chips, right? A, a GPU cluster, right? So I would argue that one important difference is the difference between causality and entailment, which is that a computer is a causal system. Human cultures are systems that run on norms that involve entailment. So two plus two is four. Why is two plus two four? Because of the laws of what? Mathematics, that's entailment, right? Why, if I were to say a bunch of swears right now and do a bunch of crazy stuff, would that be wrong? Not because of the laws of causality, would it be wrong for me to make a social transgression? It's completely causally possible. In fact, more probable if you think about the state of the nervous system, causally. So the constraint of the normative, the constraint of entailment, vis-a-vis -vis the causal. So AI systems are causal systems. That's why we shouldn't talk to them as if they can take responsibility for their actions. All right? They can't. Personhood is the use of language to take responsibility for your actions and specifically your inferential commitments, which you're making through the use of language. AIs aren't language using beings. They don't make inferential commitments. They don't make any types of commitments. They just rearrange things on a screen in ways that they get the response. Human social feedback is in the realm of norms and the realm of entailment. I mean, it's different than causality as a self-organizing process. So yeah, there's no collective intelligence over there, but there's enough causality to do amazing, dangerous, and beautiful things, right? But it's fundamentally Back, I'm going to jump in again, sorry, yeah. to do this because we've got such short time. I want Rupert to ask a question. Sorry, Rupert, it'll have to be brief. Zach, you'll have to be brief. I can see that we're talking in very deep topics, but I did want to yeah. spread the talk just a little. Yeah. So Good. sorry because it's, I, you know, it, it, it feels bad to curtail discussion, Rupert. Yeah, yeah, very challenging and interesting stuff. I, I was just wondering if you weren't to some extent, and I apologize for using this word, you've got to be brief, naively assuming a certain sapience, a certain rationality, which is already untransparently constructed by print literacy, you know, Walter Ong and so on, and various postmodern critiques of this idea of this autonomous conscious self. So we're perhaps always in this position, perhaps all life is in this position. So clearly there is a threat to the current form of humanity but are you sure this is the ultimate form or is it not possible as Nietzsche said that man is something to be overcome that's what that's what I said I said the transhumanists totally disagree with me <clears throat> the people who think that the billions of years of evolution that were brought into the current form of sapiens uh has no intrinsic value or that perhaps its value is actually itself overcoming through the creation of a digital form that extincts it. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is that the more, yeah. Sorry, there's also post-humanism, which is rather different, that ultimately there's only one consciousness and it moves through nature and it moves through us and it's much bigger than us and we should, in a sense, participate in that. I, okay, I, I'm going yeah. to, well, I'm, I'm, I, I just feel we could end up talking for hours on this. What I'm going to do is I absolutely support Rupert. I think it's a really great comment, Zach. I'll give you like a sentence to respond to the, the world in which we live. <laughs> wow. There's no way to respond to that, except I would love to talk for hours about it. Yeah. Fabulous. I look forward to it too. And I'm sorry to be so brutal, but it is, you know, we've hit 8am in the morning here and we have to have to keep on moving.